too, so I'm sorry. I still must know that you guys totally internalize how awesome it is that you're in Jerusalem. Alright? Well, we'll get back to that. My name is Avi Abelo. Grew up in New York City. New York is here. Um, uh, where? Up west side, where? 67! We're from 73 West End. Stand yeah, really you're awesome too. You're awesome too. We're going to have 73 West End. Which one is the most? SAI? Come in. So I was one of the first SAI crew. Cam Stones? Do you know Joker? Yeah. Ah, he knows. Obviously, he's my son. No way. He's a counselor for me to vote this summer, second month. All right, I grew up in New York City. My son is a stoner, but I was I.O. and the I.O. is a cat. TBI. I finished high school. I basically did early admissions for, for, for yeshiva. And I went to summer school of college instead of going to TBI. All my friends had fun at TBI. I went to summer school to finish all my credits, made aliyah, and went straight to yeshiva. Instead of 12th grade, went straight to, to learning in, uh, in yeshiva. So, like Devon told you, uh, I live in Ephraim with my family. My wife is right there. Say hi, Rachel. Hi. One of my sons, my 10th grader, who's uh, right there also. He just graduated 10th grade, same as you. Um, we live in Ephraim, and we drove here into Shalai. And like I started saying to you at the beginning, I don't know how many of you understand how unbelievable it is that you guys are in Yushan, that you're in Jerusalem. Today is Tisha B'Av. What are we mourning? Destruction of the temple. What else? Destruction of both temples. Uh, that's great, but what does the destruction of the temple represent even more than just the temple? What? Our failure as a people. Okay. What? Exile. Okay. And part of that whole package, all your answers are correct, is total destruction of Jerusalem. Alright, 2,000 years ago. We're talking about 70 AD, like 2019. So 1,980 years ago, Jerusalem was totally destroyed. Destroyed. Nothing. It was plowed over. And the Jewish people, we were totally, we were, we, we were in a place that we didn't understand what to do with ourselves. This was our homeland. Jerusalem was our capital. Harabayit, the Temple Mount, the Beit HaMikdash, was the center of our existence as a people. And all of a sudden, it was gone. Now, last week, when I met Tavora and the other bus of uh, Mahath at Ozbegal, I was there as an IDF soldier. On my reserve, on Yulalim. And let me tell you a little story to help you understand why I was so happy to be doing Yulalim and meeting Tavora in Bush And I'm going to take you back to when I was in Manhattan Day School, fourth grade, in New York City. Fourth grader, a 10 year old kid. And, um, Actually, when I was in the army 20 years ago, I was rummaging through my parents' basement. 
in that crowd. My parents also live in that crowd. And I found a box, and I was just going through the box. In the box, I found all homework assignments that my mother kept for me. I have no clue why, but she kept these homework assignments. And I found these from elementary school. And I picked out a paper from fourth grade. Again, why she kept this, I have no clue, but I'm glad she did, because it gives me a great story. I looked at this paper from this homework assignment. It was a 10-year-old kid. And it was a very simple homework assignment. Write down your three goals in life, your three dreams that you want to accomplish in life. All right? So here I am, 20-year-old, right now, looking over this fourth grade homework assignment. I'm a soldier. I was home on leave for Shabbat. And I'm looking at this. What's dream number one? I want to live in Israel. What was dream number two? I want to serve in the Israeli army. What was dream number three? I want to be really rich so I can give a lot of charity, a lot of stuff. So I can say, Baruch Hashem, I am very blessed to have fulfilled two out of my three <laughs> dreams as a 10-year-old. I am still working on the third, and my family would love for me to work on that one as well. But where was I as a kid? Again, I was a 10-year-old kid. That I already knew that I wanted to live in Israel. I already knew that I wanted to serve in the Israeli army. That makes me proud. Even though I could have stopped serving years ago, I'm already past the age. But I continue serving in high the way that I serve too. Because even as a kid, I loved history. I was a bookworm. No matter where it was, during the week, on Shabbat, there were no smartphones back then. So if you were bored, you actually picked up a book and read. Right? Because you can go to a screen. So I used to pick up books. And I love history books. I loved reading about George Washington, about Benjamin Franklin, about the American Civil War, about Europe, about the Middle Ages, about Jewish history, Bible stories. Joseph, Abraham, or whether you were books or storybooks or learning from from Christian what I love, I love history. I love reading history, love internalizing it. And also the Holocaust was something that I already got above in my head about reading up and watching movies um, uh, and, the, and the Second World War and all of that. So even as a kid, I understood how blessed we were to have the state of Israel. Because we have 2,000 years of history that we were persecuted everywhere we were. Everywhere. We were expelled from Poland. We were expelled from Britain. We were expelled from Spain, the Inquisition. We had the Holocaust. We had the ones in Arab Muslim countries. Almost everywhere we were, we were persecuted. Never able to defend ourselves. Never in our own homeland. And as a kid, I understood that. And that's why my dream was, I don't want to live outside of Israel. The state of Israel exists. The Jewish people were back home where we're supposed to be. I'm going to go home. And I just didn't want to go home. I want to take advantage to stand up and defend my people. Something my grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, etc., 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 we're not able to do for 2,000 years. So my wife and my son know this. Every time I get to put on my army green to go to Mulemin to do reserve, I feel proud and privileged and blessed to be living in the most blessed generation for us to be Jews, to be proud Jews, to stand up for what we believe in, to proudly walk the streets with our tzitzit, to proudly walk the streets with our people, to proudly put on army green and stand up with a gun to defend ourselves if necessary in our homeland. That's nothing to take for granted. And I don't. And even though here in Israel it's a law that you turn 18, you have to serve in the army, so it's mandatory, it's a mandatory draft, I don't look at it as mandatory. I look at it as a privilege. Something that our ancestors were not able to do. And us today in our generation, we are able to do. Now, I wanted to put a video on here, but this doesn't work. So I'm going to try to bring the video over here. Everyone can stay seated. Let's see how far I can get this. Over 
over here. It's pretty loud, and it's only going to play for like 30 seconds, all right? And I want you to pay attention. Everyone, it's very, very short. Come over here. Okay, that's it. What did you just hear? There wasn't a bar called the Revolt. The Jewish rebellion against the Roman Empire, okay, back which began in 66 AD, alright? But there was a very, very important word in there. Where did the revolt take place? Judea. Alright? That word is so critical. First of all, first of all, this is the most powerful documentary about Chorban Beit Hamikdash and the destruction of Jerusalem produced by the BBC as part of a, I think it's a six or eight part series of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire lasted for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. Alright? It was the most powerful, biggest, successful empire in all of history. And in an eight episode television movie series, who did they make sure to be part of the story? Judea. Judea. The Jews. We were the most successful rebellion against the Roman Empire. We are a tiny, tiny speck on a map. We meant nothing to the Roman Empire. In terms of size, in terms of importance. And yet, even in history, they understand that our story is the world's story. Now, I'm just going to bring, I'm going to jump forward to contemporary issues today. Because today, we are dealing with a society that is trying to steal our history. Because what does the media try to tell us? And what do our enemies try to tell the media? And what do anti-Israel activists in high schools and in colleges, what do they say today? Jerusalem is not Jewish history. Jerusalem doesn't belong to the Jews. Not only that, we would never hear that this land doesn't belong to us. And one of the things I tell people is, wait a second, you know what? Don't believe the Bible. Like, oh, don't go to the Bible. I put the Bible aside. I put the Bible. You don't use the Bible, don't use the Bible. Do you not believe in Roman history? Go to any history book. Don't go to a Jewish history book. Go to world history about the Roman Empire. And in every single book, you will see that the most successful rebellion against the Roman Empire were the Jews in Judea. That's why we're called Jews, because we're from. Judea. Don't let anyone take your history away from you. It's the most simplest fact to understand and to internalize in order to deal with the anti, the growing anti-Israel sentiment that is taking place all around us and all around you. Even in our own schools it's happening. All you have to do is remember Tisha B'Av. I fast every year on Tisha B'Av because I am mourning the loss of the second temple, of the first temple, of Jerusalem, at our sovereignty in our homeland that we were then exiled for 2,000 years. This is why we fast every year. A, a people that doesn't know its history, doesn't know its presence, and doesn't know where it's going. We know our history. Don't lose it. Study history. Know your history. That's why we have all the chagim. Alright. Now I'm going to touch upon why we're fasting. Before I do that, I want to, I want to be bombastic with you for a second. And I'm going to give you two proofs I know God exists. Alright? I'm not a rabbi. I studied many years in yeshiva. No rabbi. 
but I want to give you two simple proofs on how all of us can see and understand that God exists in you on the It's really, really simple. And Anthony knows this, because I just told him last week. Psst. Proof number one. The Jewish people exist. That might sound like so simple. It would make no sense whatsoever. But understand. Use your logic for a second. All of you guys are probably good at history or you're better than others. You know about the Holocaust, you know about the Pogroms, you know about the Roman Empire. It makes no logical, rational sense whatsoever that the Jewish people have survived thousands of years of persecution and exile. One of the most powerful nations in the world today not America, a, a nation in the Far East. What nation? China. Very good. China is also an ancient culture. Do you know who the Chinese look up to, admire, and are jealous of? The Jewish people and the state of Israel. Because they can't understand how we have succeeded in holding on to our culture for thousands of years through persecutions and exile. Because most Chinese who leave China, you know what happens? They stop being connected to the Chinese culture. They go to America, they become American. They go to France, they become French. They go to England, they become English. Guess what? Jews, no matter where we go in the world, what are we first? Jewish. We're Jews. We're not white, we're not black, we're not brown, we're not yellow. We're not American, we're not British, we're not French, we're Jews. Sometimes our ancestors lived in Spain, sometimes our ancestors lived in Morocco, sometimes our ancestors lived in, in Poland, sometimes they lived in Britain, sometimes in France, sometimes in America. But bottom line is we are Jews. That's the success of our people, and it's only success because Someone up there wants it to happen. He created the system, the Torah, the lifestyle that allows us to stay the Jewish people no matter what we come, go through. And yes, I believe it's a miracle that the Jewish people exist. Because if God didn't want us to exist, we wouldn't be here. It makes no rational reason whatsoever that the Jewish people are still around. That's proof number one. Proof number two, that God exists, another bombastic proof state of Israel exists. Does it make any rational sense whatsoever that the state of Israel exists? Our people were decimated in the Holocaust by Nazi Germany. Six million of us. Gone. And after that destruction, we have our own homeland. There's a very, very famous um, uh, essay written by Rav Soloveitchik, called the Deed Effect. Anyone familiar with the Deed Effect? Look it up, you do? Okay, if you're not, look it up and read it. Rav Soloveitchik basically writes, what's called the Deed Effect? Called the Deed is my beloved's voice, is knocking, do think. Right? What's Rav Soloveitchik writing about? He's writing about God's knocking of milk and return to the land of Israel. That the whole existence of the state of Israel, with the United Nations voting, for the whole Arab Muslim world attack God's voice to the Jewish people, go home, I'm performing all these miracles for you, go home. Israel exists today, that we survived the war of independence in 1948, that we survived in 1967. You know there's a story, I don't remember who the name of the general is, but everyone get familiar with West Point Academy in America, right? That is the academy for officers training in the United States of America for American Army officers. How do you learn how to be an officer? You learn from battles. You learn from historic battles. What did they do in that battle to win? What did they do in that battle to win? Someone was once in a class and they asked the teacher, why don't you teach us about the battles of Israel? And the teacher basically said, we can't, they're all miracles. There's no way to explain it. There is no rational way to explain how we won each and every war till this day. 
We have to be the best army. We have to be trained. In every army, there's mistakes. In every war, there's mistakes. In every army, there's in every war, there's catastrophes. War is horrendous. But again, we're a tiny little country. Forget about today, where we have big technology and one of the most technological powerhouses of the world. 1948, we had nothing. Do you know where we got our planes from? We had to smuggle them in as parts and put them together here. And they were all planes, some of them from France. We only had like three or four or five, I don't remember the exact number. No training whatsoever. We fought five armies. The largest armies in the entire Muslim Middle East. The Jordanian army was run by the British soldiers, officers themselves, trained by the British army. Makes no sense whatsoever that we won the war of independence. 1967 makes no sense. Every single war makes no rational sense. No one could explain it to you. And my answer is simple. It's proof that God exists. We're only here because God wants us to be here. If at any moment God did not want us to be here, we wouldn't be here. Which comes to us and why we're fasting. Now, who is the Roman general who destroyed Jerusalem and the temple? Titus. Very good. Titus. Yes and no. Okay, ready for this? Yes and no. The movie I was just showing you before, that if you've never seen, you should go watch it, and anyone interested, I'll send you a link. It's the most powerful video. I show it to my kids every year, even if they don't want to see it. Right? Except he was sleeping this morning, so he didn't get to see it. It's based on the writings of Josephus Flavius. Who's Josephus Flavius? Okay, who was he before he became a historian? Okay, Josephus Flavius is Yosef ben Matityahu. He was one of the commanders, the Jewish commanders of the rebellion against Rome. He was put in charge of the... Unfortunately, one community at a time was decimated and destroyed by the Romans. The last one of the government of war was Yod Fats, where Yosef ben Matityahu was the last stand of the Jewish forces in the Galil. We lost the battle. He was one of the only survivors. And instead of killing him, they let him live. Because the general, at the time, was Vespasian, not his son Titus. Vespasian started the, the, the war. Titus finished it. Vespasian let him live because he was extremely impressed with how he ran the war. All right, and then you know, he became Josephus, Josephus Flavius, and he wrote the books, the historical books, how do we know everything that happened in the Jewish rebellion against Rome? And that movie is based on that. And what he writes is unbelievable. When Titus destroyed Jerusalem, and as he was, he and the Roman legion were marching on the temple. They had a decision to make. What are we going to do with the temple? And there was an argument. Some of the Roman officers said, let's destroy it. They were going against Rome. How could they dare? We have to punish them and destroy the two of it. And there were others that said, no, it's one of the most beautiful structures in all of humanity. We're not going to destroy it. You know what Titus decided? 50-50 chance here. Oh, they took some stuff back. They took, they, they took the stuff anyway, but in terms of destroying, what did Titus decide? To destroy or not to destroy? Okay. He decided not to destroy. What? The Roman general Titus decided that the temple, one of the most beautiful pieces of architecture in this world, and the world was a culture of beauty, he decided no destroying the temple. What happened? His soldiers ended up destroying it anyway. So Josephus Flavius, when he's writing the war of the Jews, the when he's writing it, he's decided not to destroy the temple, but the soldiers ended up destroying it anyway. It was only destroyed because of the hand of God. Titus was a Jew. He had a 
He had a connection to his Jewish roots. He understood that even rationally, Rome was not going to destroy the Beit HaMikdash. It was not going to destroy the Temple. And yet it was destroyed anyway. Why? Because the Kaddish Baruch Hu, God decided that we didn't deserve it. It had to be destroyed. What do our rabbis and teachers teach us is the major reason the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed. The second Beit HaMikdash was destroyed. Alright, tell me, what's in that Dinam was going on at this time? What's in that Dinam? Anything concrete, see not you know that you know about that you've learned about? Yes, that's a true story. That's a good one. That's one story, but it shows that the total disrespect between Jews. Alright, now I'm going to some of you might know this, and you never put two or two together. In Jerusalem. Or in as part of the Jewish rebellion against Rome. There were a lot of Jewish, a lot of different Jewish factions. A lot. They were the Prushim, they were the Stukim, they were Kanaim, they were the Secretim. Any of these words mean anything to all you guys? No? And they were all different factions of Jews. Uh, they were Karai, right? So some Jews, some, some Jews believed in the oral law, some Jews only believed in the written law. Some Jews were more murderous than other Jews in terms of the in terms of the uh, in terms of the rebellion. They were the Essenes. They are the ones who went to Midbar Yudah. The Dead Sea Scrolls are from the Essen sect of Jews. There was a lot of division. Now this division played a deadly role in the rebellion against Rome. Because you would think if Jerusalem is under siege and the Jews have to fight off the Romans. Who would they be focused on fighting? The Romans. You want to know how bad the Sinat Hinam was in the Jewish people at the time? Even though Jerusalem was under siege, the Jews were killing one another. One faction was killing the other faction. Not one was one of the most fortified cities in the ancient world. The Romans did not know how to conquer it. They stand to be the last place to conquer after they conquered the rest of Israel. They had the Jews had to store food and water, and uh, Chazal tell us that they had 21 years worth of food, of grain and water to live off of. They could have survived any siege. When you are fighting a Roman army and you come to do a siege. You have to bring food and water to be there for your troops. You have 50,000, 100,000 troops. That's a lot of food and water you have to provide your troops in order for them to fight. And how did it only last so long? The Jews in Jerusalem had 21 years worth of food and water. They were going to outlast the Roman siege and survive. What happened to the food? <laughs> the different <laughs> Jewish factions. <laughs> Burnt the food and wheat of the other factions. So who didn't survive the siege? The Jews. This morning you read the keynotes. You read the, 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 the stories of how they starved. Chazal teach us that the ones who died an easier death were the ones who died by the sword. Watching the babies die of starvation, watching men and women eat their baby children and eat each other alive because there was no food. That was a worse death than the death of the sword by the Roman soldiers. And what brought this about? The hatred that we had between ourselves that was actually translated into killing one another. So when we fast today, we're supposed to be thinking about, like, oh my God, how horrible a situation it was. And God is running things. He's running the world. If we would have been better, we would have survived. The second faith and death would not have been destroyed. It was. Because we didn't deserve it and God decided. Here in Israel today, because God decided. 
because we deserve it. We survive as a people because we have a purpose in this world. Some generations we deserve it, some generations we don't deserve it. But we have a purpose. So now, to explain the purpose, I want to just ask for 10 volunteers to come up and come over here and go. 10 volunteers. Technology kind of coming out of Israel? Mind blowing! In every way. In medicine. In medical devices. In dealing with cancer. In dealing with different illnesses. Agriculture. Helping countries around the world plant and get more, more out, of their, out of their fields when they have little water. Water! Do you guys know? Are you going to the hotel today? Yeah. Are right? you going there again before they go? Yeah. Okay. When you go, did anyone notice that there's a special water machine at the back of the hotel? Yeah. yeah. What, how do they make water? Is that my blowing? <laughs> Israel created a device that creates water out of air. Now, if you think about it, you all studied science. We all know that there is humidity in the air. How could no one have thought of that sooner? Figure out how to take the humidity and break down the molecules. Some of you are going to be scientists, probably. And then create that to be drinking water. No one ever thought of it until some smart people in Israel thought of it. That's just one of the thousands of unbelievable things that are developing here in Israel that are helping the world. The world. To me, when I say ki mitziel teitze Torah, from Zion comes forth Torah, it's not just the five books of Moses and the Gemara and the Mishnah. It's the Torah of the Jewish people of what happens when we are who we are supposed to be, where we are supposed to be. And the final message is to understand the Jewish people has a purpose. Each and every one of you has a purpose. The question is, what is it? Okay. So let me ask you this. I'll give you an easier question. What does it mean that the Jewish people are the chosen people? What does that mean? We say, I'm school out with the chosen people. What does that mean? What? Can't hear. God chose us. God chose us. Good. What does that mean? God chose us. There's no wrong answer. No wrong answer. Go for it. Give me what you got. Okay? We got a purpose. We accepted the Torah. We accepted the Torah. Okay? Alright, so I'm going to start with the accept of the Torah because Chazal teach us that, believe it or not, God did not choose the, 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 the Jews first. Let me say that again. He did not choose the Jews first. He went to other nations. He said, want to have my Torah? Each and every other nation said no. Finally he came to the Jews, and the Jews said yes. Okay? So we accepted, we accepted the Torah, and we were chosen to live our lives, lives according to the Torah, but ultimately... I like to give this example, but one of some of you guys, some of you will be scientists, some of you will be teachers. When you're in the front of the classroom, every once in a while, you choose one student to either answer something or do, uh, or, or do an example on the board, not because they're the best, not because you love them, but in order to show an example to the rest of the class, you chose one. You gave that student the responsibility of showing the rest of the class what to do. We, the Jewish people, are that one student. God chose us with a purpose. <clears throat> it's not an easy one, because we are responsible for following a whole Torah of 613 commandments that not always do we want to do, not always do we understand. But our purpose as a people is to live that way as Jews in order to make an impact on the whole world, on all of humanity. That is our purpose. That is why God keeps us alive even though we defy all rational logic. And as you guys grow up, going to 11th grade, you have a decision to make. How 
serious are you going to take your role as a Jew? Are you just going to throw it aside? You're just going to say, I don't care. It's too much for me. I don't understand. Or are you going to say, I was chosen for something. I got this special gift. It's not easy. But any of you who know about workouts and exercise, no pain, no gain. Same thing with the Jew. We want to gain the true meaning of what it means to be a Jew and be able to fulfill our purpose. It's not easy. We have to follow the mitzvot. We keep Shabbat. We have Tayyab Mitzvot. We get up for Dalit three times a day. We put on Tzvot like we're guys. It's not always easy. Not always do we want to do it. Not always are we in the mood. But that's the question each of you have to ask yourselves. How serious are you about fulfilling your purpose as a Jew in this world? And I'll tell you right now, not all of you will. I wish I could tell you all of you will. Not all of you will. I look back at my matha, and thank God there's like 10 of us living in Israel today. And then I have some of them, they're not religious anymore. Some of them today are even anti-Israel, actively anti-Israel. People I used to laugh with, sing songs of Sudash Lishit, playing Torah with. It happens to the best of us. It's not easy being a Jew. But it is so fulfilling. And all of you are able to point to Israel and see how unbelievable Israel is and everything Israel is doing for the world and feel proud of being a Jew. And hopefully wish and dream that you too come and live here and take part in this miracle called the State of Israel. You know, Rabbi Riskin, he's the rabbi of Ephraim where I live, I grew up with him, he's the rabbi of Lincoln Square Synagogue in Manhattan, uh, in Manhattan when I was growing up. Is that where you go? Okay, so I was in the old building. He used to say that unfortunately many Jews <laughs> When they come to Israel, they treat, they treat Israel like Disneyland. It's just another vacation spot. It just happens to be the Jewish homeland. Whereas the true uniqueness that should inspire and excite each and every Jew about coming here to visit and hopefully you'll live is that it's the Holy Land. It's not Disneyland. You don't go to Israel for, for a vacation instead of going to the Bahamas or going to Florida. You come to Israel. Because it's Israel, because it's your land, because it's your birthright. So may you finish these last few hours of the fast to be inspired, I hope just a little bit, to be proud Jews. And even though it's hard and we all go back to our daily lives, each and every day ask yourself, what can I do today to be a better person, to be a better Jew? Because it's not just about you, it's not just about your family, but we actually have a purpose. And that purpose is to help the whole world and all of humankind just by being proud Jews. It's that simple, but it's so hard. So, Lashon HaBav Yushalayim, may we all merit the rebuilding of the Beit HaMikdash, which is a place that's special where all people come to pray. It's not just special for the Jewish people. We want the Beit HaMikdash to be back so that we love one another, we pray with one another. There are Jews, Muslims, and Christians, and everyone coming to the Beit HaMikdash to pray together. That is what the temple is all about. That's our purpose. What are you going to do about it to make it happen? It's an easy and meaningful test. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please click like and share so that as many people as possible can see this great information about Israel. If you're not yet following this page, please click follow. And finally, for more great videos about Israel, go to IsraelUnwired.com and sign up for the newsletter.